Well, amen, amen. I think we could go home and, uh, and we've gotten all kinds of gospel this morning. But y'all know that's not how we roll, so we're going to keep it rolling. More gospel, more good news. Personally for me, uh, this has been a really sweet year. Uh, there's been lots of personal, unique milestone celebrations. Uh, so after a decade going at seminary, it took me a decade, yes. I graduated from seminary. That was in May. Uh, I turned 40 years old. Uh, a few weeks ago, we celebrated our 15th wedding anniversary, and then yesterday, um, my daughter turned 13, so our first teenager. And even today, now the fourth anniversary of King's Cross Church. So there's just been lots to celebrate, and my heart and posture has been in, uh, at some level, a state this year of uh, meditating and thinking on God's faithfulness and his kindness, kind of in all these different celebrations. And so I come to this morning, uh, I've been joking with a number of people all week, all kind of gifts going out about what I was going to be doing, how I was going to be dancing and celebrating. Uh, and so the good thing is I'm down here in the corner, y'all can't see me, but amen. But as a church, we've celebrated, we've seen so many things even today celebrating new life. But also in a, as a church in the midst of this year, we've, we've experienced pain, the sudden and tragic death of our brother Desmond. The death of uh, saints that joined our church from Parkway, the elderly saints. We've suffered with sickness and COVID-19 and, and challenges and fights with sin and people walking away from the faith. So there's great celebrations, there's great suffering, but for all those who are in Christ, there's a joy that permeates the highest of highs and the lowest of lows. In fact, this joy is commanded us in Scripture, Philippians 4. So it's not an option to have joy as a Christian. It's commanded. This is either something you obey and have or you disobey and do not have. Paul says rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything but by everything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your requests be made known to God and the peace of God which surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Unshakable joy that leads to a peace that surpasses understanding. This kind of joy is uniquely Christian. It's not a joy that's depending upon ever-changing circumstances or fickle and often foolish hearts. No, it's a joy that's unshakable as the kingdom of Christ. In fact, it's a joy that Christ himself, the king, gives to all of the citizens in his kingdom. Do you know in John 15, he says, As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you, that your joy may be, full, uh, that my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be full. Jesus means to address this kind of joy to you today in Matthew chapter 13. In Matthew 13, he wants to get at what is this joy he's talking about that leads to this peace that surpasses all understanding, that is not contingent upon circumstances or feelings that come and go, but a joy that lasts, a joy that is eternal. Now, in Matthew 13, as if you've been here with us, we're just continuing to walk right through Matthew's gospel. Matthew 13 is Jesus' third of five discourses in Matthew's gospel. And it's a discourse, a teaching section of parables. In the first parable, the parable of the sower and the seeds, Jesus taught about how different people respond to the word of the kingdom. That this gospel word is proclaimed and some people respond uh, with excitement and joy and fall away. Others kind of follow for a season then after a period of time gets choked out. Some people hear and ignore altogether. Other people hear, respond, believe, and bear much fruit. And so Jesus talked about these are the kinds of responses you can anticipate when the word of the kingdom is proclaimed. Then in the parable of the wheat and weeds and then the mustard seed and the yeast, Jesus taught how the kingdom grows. That often the kingdom starts as this small and seemingly insignificant thing. But in the end, it will grow and be glorious and there will be a judgment where Christ separates out those who are his and those who are his enemies. In these last three parables in Matthew 19, Jesus teaches about the supreme value of the kingdom. So first, here's the responses of the kingdom. Then, then here's the, the, the reality of how Christ is, it, how the kingdom grows, slow and, and unimpressive at first. Now he's saying, but let me close this discourse teaching you the supreme value, the treasure, and indeed the joy that comes out of seeing the value of the kingdom. He teaches about this kingdom and, and shows that when you discover the kingdom of Christ, you will joyfully sacrifice whatever it takes to have this kingdom. 
That when you really see the kingdom of Christ, when you really see King Jesus, then you will gladly and joyfully sacrifice any and everything if you can just have this king in his kingdom. I have glorious news this morning for everyone in the room. For the non-Christian, all the way to the most seasoned saint, the kingdom of Christ is better than you think it is. The kingdom of Christ is better than you think it is. So to the non-Christian, I say to you, the kingdom of Christ is better. You ought to repent and believe. We'll talk about that more in just a moment. But even for the most mature believer, inasmuch as God has given you grace and revealed himself to you in Christ, it's even better than you think it is. There is a joy in King Jesus that you're not yet currently aware of. You've tasted it in part already, but not yet in full. There's better yet to come. There's more value being known and loved by the king than you currently know. So let's pray and ask for his help that even at the end of this, we would know just a little bit more. God, our Father, giver of all good gifts, please, we beg you, please grant us the ability to know more of the value of your son, King Jesus, and life in his kingdom. We ask you to do this by the power of your spirit, and we pray in Jesus' good name. Amen. Three simple questions for you this morning. Question number one, have you found the treasure? Question number one, have you found the treasure? Look at verse 44. And we're going to notice kind of two different responses to discovering the treasure. First, some stumble upon it. Others search it out and find it. But first, those who stumble upon it. Verse 44. The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in the field, which a man found and covered up. Then, in his joy, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. So notice this first parable is pretty simple. There's a man. He's living his ordinary life is the sense of the text. And he stumbles upon this treasure hidden in the field. So he's not looking for a treasure. He's about his ordinary life. And suddenly he trips and falls and looks down and there's a treasure hidden in the field that he realizes, oh my goodness, this treasure is worth more than all the treasures I have combined and put together all in total. And so he just stumbles upon this treasure. He does not have to be talked into selling and sacrificing everything that he has to buy the field because he knows this treasure is supremely more valuable than that which I have. And so if we're thinking about Christianity, understand, I'll have a little bit of fun here. Just let me poke a little bit of fun. But the person who really sees the kingdom of Christ doesn't have to hear the old hymn, Just As I Am, played 73 times over with the pastor begging, if just one person would come down front and be talked into it. No, no, no. The person who discovers the kingdom of Christ is like, I'll give everything to have this. I don't, like, you don't have to talk me into this. This is so beautiful. This treasure is so supremely valuable. I'll give up everything if I can just have this. In his joy, he sells it all. He simply makes a value judgment. This treasure is greater than all my treasures. It's kind of like this. If you just imagine, let's say your grandpa had a conversation with you, and he said, hey, I've got a bunch of, uh, I got a bunch of coins I want to give to you. So at some point, come to the house. I want to give you these coins, and, and I don't know much about them. I don't know if they're really worth anything, but just, just come to the house. There's hundreds of them, hundreds and hundreds of these coins, and you find out when you get there what he meant was Bitcoin. And it's like, uh-oh, what he just described is actually worth millions and millions and millions of dollars. So at that moment, you're not thinking, like, you got to find out. There's this fee. you got to pay to access it. And you realize, man, this, I might have to sell everything I own in order to access and buy, the, the, uh, pay this fee in order to get this treasure. This is not a difficult decision for you. Because the treasure you've happened upon, that you stumbled upon, is so supremely more valuable than everything that you own. This is an easy decision for you to sell all that you have and have this treasure. The one who stumbles upon the kingdom of Christ realizes the reign and rule of Christ is greater than any career I could have. The one who stumbles upon the kingdom of Christ realizes that knowing Christ is greater, even worth more than my precious children. The kingdom of Christ is worth more than all the material possessions I could pile up in this life. It's just better. So this man stumbles upon the treasure, realizes there's no greater treasure, and therefore no greater joy. This next person, next parable, verse 45, though, is searching it out. So this is not a, whoops, look what I found. This is a, like, I'm begging, I'm looking, where is the greatest treasure? Where's the greatest value in life? Verse 45, again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls, who on finding one pearl of great value went and sold all that he had and bought it. The second person, again, is on a search, 
He's an expert on pearls. He's an expert on these kinds of treasures. And he's saying, I want to find the best pearl, the most precious pearl, the most valuable pearl. And upon finding that pearl, is willing to sell everything else, including his other pearls, in order to have this one of supreme value, this one precious pearl. One of the reasons I loved, I worked uh, for seven years right out of college in campus ministry, and that even to this day, if I get any chance to talk to college students, I never turn that down. I get to go and speak at a conference uh, over New Year's, and Jonathan be lead music there. One of the reasons I always say yes to this is because this, this parable reminds me of college students. They're searching for life. They're in that season of life where it's like, I'm looking. I'm going to find out, like, I will look in intellectual things. I'll look in the party scene. I'll look in the sexual scene. I'm going to look in every. I'm, I'm just searching. I'm trying to find that which is worth living for. What's the greatest thing in life I should give the rest of my life to? The student is looking for that. They're like this man in search of a, a great pearl. And one of the other things I love about college ministry and reaching out to college students is when they find this pearl of great, great, great price, they're willing to sell everything to have it. Just like this man. Why? Why is this the case? Why is this, what is Jesus teaching us? Whether you stumble upon the kingdom or you search it and find it, why is this so valuable? Why is it, as one scholar said, there's something about the kingdom of heaven which makes extravagant action the only appropriate response? Extravagant action. So again, if you're like, eh, like you don't get it. You haven't seen it correctly. You haven't seen it truly. No, there's an, there's, this demands, this king, this kingdom demands a massive response that this is the greatest treasure ever. Why? Think about some of the things that we've studied through Matthew that we've seen in Christ. Why is he so precious? Think about his teaching. Think about how he teaches in such a way that cuts your heart open and reveals and shows it to you. Here's what's really going on inside of your heart. Here are the motives underneath all of your actions. How he can teach and expose both the religious and the irreligious, the moral and the immoral, and show that both are guilty apart from God. How in the Sermon on the Mount, he can teach in such a way that explodes the minds of all the scribes and the Pharisees who think they're, they're righteous and got it all together. But then he's saying, look, you're not even in the ballpark of right and all together. Think of his teaching. Think of his wisdom. There's no one like Christ. Proverbs 4.2 tells us, buy truth and do not sell it. Buy wisdom and instruction and understanding. So the, so the wisdom of Proverbs says, buy truth and don't sell it. So this is not one of those things you keep trading and selling to get a more precious uh, uh, value. He said, no, no, once you get this, don't sell that one, keep that one. And how about the wisdom of Christ? He's taught in such a way that even his enemies are like nobody. Nobody teaches like this man. So one of the great values of the kingdom of Christ is he's got a wisdom no one else have. He indeed is wisdom in the flesh. But also think about the value of Christ in his kingdom and his authority over disease, demons, and death, Matthew chapter 8 and 9. We saw him demonstrate, Matthew put together these, these miracles, these healings. The deaf and the blind and the mute, the bleeding woman, the, the one uh, possessed by a whole legion of demons cast into a herd of pigs. So he's demonstrated and flexed that he's a king over all things, that when he speaks, demons must listen. When he speaks, disease must obey. When he speaks, everything must listen to his voice. He's got that kind of power. So he's got this kind of wisdom, and then he's got a power that can save and deliver you from anything, literally anything. Everything must bow the knee to King Jesus, everything in creation. So the value is this is the one who's in charge of all. Think about his company. So why is this kingdom so valuable? Well, because of the wisdom of Christ, but also because of the power of Christ, but also because of the company of Christ. Think of who he spent his time with. Tax collectors and sinners, prostitutes outcasts of society, those who realize they don't have it all together, such that the religious people would look at Jesus and ask his disciples, why, do you, why does your teacher eat with people such as these? And Jesus would respond and let them know, because sick people know they need a doctor. I came not to call sin, uh, righteous, but the sinners to repentance. He demonstrated he's got a mercy and a kindness that's unlike any other, so he's got the power of God, and yet he's got a gentle Mercy and kindness that's come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden. I'll give you rest from gentle and lowly of heart. Bring your burdens to this God. Why is the kingdom so valuable? Because one with so much power would be so compassionate and so kind. One who should come crush us is the one who came to be crushed for us. This Christ, this mercy, think of the kind of people he spends his time loving on. Those who the religious would judge as problematic. He's gentle and lowly with sinners and sufferers, those who have diseases, those who have demons, those who have the worst sickness of all called sin. He's gentle and lowly and says, bring your burdens to me. 
Think about this. Why is the kingdom so valuable? Why is the king so valuable? The one who ought to judge you instead lavishes you with riches of his mercy and love and makes you citizens, even co-heirs in his kingdom. What kind of king would live like this? Only the one who's the true son of God. And that's what makes his disciples be willing to make the great sacrifices, to sell all. Think about his disciples. He said to them, if you're going to be my disciple, you've got to be willing to walk away from all relationships. The one dude's like, hold up, let me go bury my father. Nope. Let the dead bury the dead. You follow me. One's like, hold on, let me get get my home in order. Let me get things. Like Jesus like, you know I got nowhere to lay my head, nowhere to rest. I'm homeless, but if you want to follow me, come follow me. I got to be more important than your family. I got to be more important than your home. You got to be willing to make these sacrifices. And these disciples were willing to walk away from the relationships and then find out over in chapter 12, verse 49, that he gives new family. When he said, these are my mother, brother, fathers, uh, 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 brothers and sisters. So leave, be willing to leave every relationship behind. Any relationship that prevents you from following King Jesus is a relationship that means to harm you. He says, leave it all behind and come follow me and I'll give you a new family. Leave your home behind and I will go to my father's house to prepare a place for you. So you can be homeless in this life because you got a home in the one that matters forever. So he makes these calls. You see this kingdom and you're like, I am willing to give up any and everything, any and every relationship, any and every possession I have. Willing to walk away from earthly riches because I know they they rust. In the end, I can't take any of it with me. To live for money is such a foolish errand. You won't take a dime with you to eternity. (laughs) That's what Jesus teaches. No, store up treasures in heaven. That's where you should live for treasures. It's not wrong to live for treasures. Don't live for the foolish ones that go away. Live for the eternal ones that you enjoy forever. This is why his disciples are willing to walk away from safety and security and comfort. Because you see this king and his kingdom and you have a joy. A resurrection joy. You're willing to be unsafe because you know on the other side of death there is safety if you're in Christ. Do you know that after Christ resurrects, the women go to the tomb. They find the angel And they're scared at first, and the angel calms them down and responds to them and says, Matthew 28, verse 6, He's not here, for he has risen, as he said. Come see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples that he's risen from the dead, and behold, he's going before you to Galilee. There you will see him. See, I've told you. They departed quickly from the tomb with fear and what? Great joy. And ran to tell his disciples. So when we see the kingdom, we understand this. Jesus has a resurrection joy. That he went up to, the, to the, the, the person who was dead in Matthew 8, 9 that we saw and raised her from dead. And that he can raise us from the dead spiritually and that sure as we raised spiritually, we will be raised eternally and physically. This is the great treasure of the kingdom. Do you have this treasure? Have you seen the glory of Christ the King? And what it looks like to walk with him and live in this kingdom? We should be asking and concerned about, am I qualified to have this treasure? That should be the next kind of question in your mind is if this treasure is that beautiful that people be willing to sell everything to have it, am I qualified or better yet, unqualified? Are you unqualified for such a treasure? I'll explain in just a minute. Verse 47. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a net that was thrown into the sea and gathered fish of every kind. When it was full, men drew it ashore and sat down and sorted the good into containers but threw away the bad. So it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come out, separate the evil from the righteous, and throw them into the fiery furnace. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Now I won't spend a lot of time um, explaining all of this. This is the same. It's a parallel uh, parable to what Jesus taught uh, with the the parable of the weeds uh, back in verse 24 to 30 and 36 to 43. But Jesus makes the exact same point. A person's eternity is based upon Christ's just judgment. Like a dragnet that's thrown out to bring in a bunch of fish now, you like to go fishing. You, you bring in some fish. There's some good ones. There's some bad ones. And he says, in the end, my angels will go forth, and they'll bring in all of humanity, all kinds of people, every kind of human being. And he was, the, the angels will go out and will separate good from evil, the righteous from the unrighteous. This, this will happen on Judgment Day at the end of the age. And notice the evil people will be thrown in that place where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth, namely hell. Now, this ought to be terrifying to you. Christians believe Jesus taught, this is the third time he's used this phrase and taught this, even in this gospel, first eight, uh, chapter 8, verse 12, then 13, 42, and, and here. This should be terrifying. Hell is a real place of eternal conscious torment. This is very unpopular, but very true. Even in the church, all these pew studies are finding out Christians don't believe this to be true. So they're just 
Saying I'm Christian, I don't like that, so I reject it. That's not what a Christian does. A Christian believes the word of God. And we're taught here that hell really is a place of everlasting torment, and those who are evil will go there. So the question is then, what's the difference between good people and evil people, the righteous people and the unrighteous people? How do I know if I'm qualified to experience and inherit this great treasure that's worth all eternity, worth selling everything in this life to have? How do I know? To the rich young ruler, great illustration even of this reality. Matthew chapter 19. Behold, a young man came up to him saying, Teacher, what good deed must I do to have eternal life? So he walks up. What do I have to do to know I'm the good one? I want eternal life. Teacher, what, what, what must I do? Jesus said to him, why do you ask me about what is good? There's only one who is good. If you didn't enter life, keep the commandments. He said to him, which ones? Jesus said, you shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness. Honor your father and mother, and you shall love your neighbors yourself. The young man said to him, all these I've kept. What do I still lack? So notice he's like, no, no, no. I've done all these good things. But what do I still lack? What do I still need to do? Jesus said to him, if you be perfect, go and sell what you possess and give to the poor and you, and you will have treasure in heaven and come follow me. When the young man heard this, he went away sorrowful for he had great possessions. So this young man thinks, I'm qualified because I've done the good things. I can check off these religious boxes. What do I got to do to get into heaven? And perhaps it's a humble posture. Perhaps it's an arrogant posture. But he asked the question, what is, how good is good enough? Jesus says, obey the law. He's like, okay, I have, done, I have done those things. I'm good. Externally, check, 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 check. And Jesus says, really? Go sell all you have, give to the poor, you have treasure in heaven, then come follow me. And with that one statement, he exposes, you've broken the first commandment, no other gods before me. There's a treasure you treasure more than God himself. You want to use God to get a different treasure. You're not saying these treasures all point me to and let me experience the chief treasure, God himself. And so he walks away sad. Why? Because he had great possessions. Worse yet, they had him. They were his master. And therefore, he walked away from King Jesus and says, your kingdom is not a greater treasure than all my treasures. I'd rather have my toys. No thanks to you in your heaven. So how does one become righteous enough then? Because again, this man had a, a spotless resume externally. So he's like, I've done all these things externally, just as the scribes and Pharisees would have bragged on. So how righteous is righteous enough? Now, you might read this and think, man, it seems like Jesus is teaching by works. You enter the kingdom of heaven by being a good person, and, and this is by good works. But we see the rich young ruler, that's not the case. And think about even what Jesus has taught in our study. He begins the Sermon on the Mount with what? With grace. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. So the spiritually bankrupt who come to God knowing I'm bankrupt, I have nothing good to offer you, I can't purchase the kingdom, I can't purchase entry into the kingdom by my good works, I'm poor. Jesus says, blessed are you. You're the kingdom. He says, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness in Matthew chapter 5, verse 6. Not those who have their righteousness, but they're hungry. They're thirsty for it. They're coming. They're saying, God, I want to be righteous. I want to follow you, but I'm poor. I'm broke. I'm sinful. I'm hopeless. I have no hope. God, do you have something for me? We don't become righteous enough by our own effort of righteousness. We become righteous enough by the righteousness of Christ who later says in that same sermon, I didn't come to abolish the law, but to fulfill it. And then he says, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you won't enter the kingdom of heaven. So all those religious leaders you're intimidated by, unless you're more righteous than them, you're not getting them. You're not getting in. But he's saying, but I came to fulfill the law. So what is he showing? What is he teaching us? We enter the kingdom of heaven. We get the righteousness of Christ given to us freely, supernaturally, by the supernatural work of Christ. When the rich young ruler asked that question, had the interaction with Jesus, he walks away sad. And his disciples at that point are scratching their head. Wait a minute. If he can't get into heaven, he's rich. He's obeyed the law externally. He's a good person. Everybody's impressed by him. If he can't make it, who can? And so they turn to Jesus in verse 23. Jesus said to his disciples, or he, Jesus turns to them and said to his disciples, Truly I say to you, only with difficulty will a rich person enter the kingdom of heaven. Again, I tell you, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. When the disciples heard this, they were greatly astonished, saying, who then can be saved? But Jesus looked at them and said, with man, this is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. Then Peter said in reply, see, we've left everything and followed you. 
We have saw the treasure that you are. We saw your kingdom. We saw the power. We saw the healing. We've heard your wisdom. We've heard your teaching. We've, we've left it all. we followed you. What then will we have? Jesus said to them, Truly I say to you, in the new world where the Son of Man will sit on his glorious throne, you who have followed me will also sit on the twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel uniquely to the apostles. And everyone... Everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or children or lands for my name's sake will receive a hundredfold and will inherit eternal life. But many who are first will be last and the last will be first. See, we see in Christ there's a supernatural work that must be done for us to have the righteousness required to enter the kingdom of heaven, even to be able to see the glorious grace and, and riches of the kingdom of heaven. And that's what the cross of Christ is about. This supernatural power is that Christ himself would fulfill the law on our behalf, in our place, and then he would climb on the cross and die for our sin. And on the third day, resurrect. So, brothers and sisters, the cross of Christ is the fountain of greater joy now and forever. It's the cross of Christ where he paid the penalty we owed and where he distributes and gives forth the righteous record of his own. And now we can buy this treasure for free. Come, all who are weary and heavy laden. So are you qualified for this treasure? Only if you realize you're unqualified. <laughs> you're only qualified if you realize I'm unqualified, but Christ is qualified and he died for my unqualifiedness and he rose so that he might give me his qualifiedness. So I'm unqualified, but he's qualified. And when he died, I died. My unqualified sin was, was punished. My situation was dealt with, and his righteousness was freely given to me to declare me righteous so that I might enter the kingdom of heaven. And when I look and when I see the cross of Christ re reconciling me to God, I was, that's the greatest treasure I could ever have. I'll sell everything for that. Happy to sell everything for that. Because if I can have God, and I have him by grace alone through the finished work of Christ, what can man do to me? If I can have God and pleasure and joy forevermore, why would I turn to lesser joys that prevent me from that joy? Third question, are you sharing the treasure? Are you sharing the treasure? Jesus says, have you understood all these things? So he turns to the disciples, he shares these parables, and he says, have you understood all these things? They said to him, yes. And he said to them, therefore, every scribe who's been trained for the kingdom of heaven is like a master of a house who brings out of his treasure what is new and what is old. This treasure, this treasure that leads to greater joy is a gift of God's grace that he promised. If you look just back to verse 11 in, in Matthew chapter 13, what did he tell these disciples when he started and started talking about parables? And he answered to them, they asked him the question, why do you speak in parables? He answered them, to you it has been given to know the secrets of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it has not been given. This treasure... Even our ability to see and understand his parables and to know the glorious grace of his treasure has been given to us freely. So you're not able to see, well, I understood the parables. That's why he lets me into his kingdom and gives me his righteousness. No, you missed it. No, he freely does this. It's been given to you to know and to understand. This is a gift of grace. But notice what he says to these disciples. He says to these disciples, that you now have the opportunity and responsibilities that the Pharisees and scribes were unable to see and hear. That you're now a scribe that can be a true scribe. You're, you're a teacher of the law can be a true teacher of the law. You can go into the old and to the new and point to Jesus as the treasure. You can go to the Old Testament and realize the Old Testament is not a bunch of moral stories to tell me how to be a good person. No, there are stories of a broken people and God sending forth a son that would save those broken people. And the New Testament now is pointing us to show us how God would save those people in Christ. Christ is the treasure of Scripture. Old and new. Now these disciples can point to and show this Christ. He's the chief treasure. He's the one we've been longing for for so long. I want you to just think about the meta narrative of Scripture and think about this statement in this moment. So, how is he the treasure of old and new? Think about the story of, of the Bible. God creates man in his own image. Out of the overflow of triune fellowship, he makes man in his image. God didn't create us because he was lonely and needed somebody to hang out with. The triune fellowship of God is so rich, there was no lack. But it overflowed into creating man in his image. Man and male and female, he created them in his own image. Creates man. And he decides, or he creates them, and he reigns and rules perfectly over them in the garden. He places them in paradise. No pain, only pleasure. 
He literally gives the world to them to reign and rule as kings and queens underneath his reign and rule. He says, no, you're going to reflect me. You're going to image forth me by reigning and ruling over this creation. So you're going to point to who I am and my good and reign and rule. And when you do that, it's going to show forth uniquely that you're created in my image. No pain, only pleasure. He merely forbids them to eat from the forbidden tree. And he tells them why. Genesis 2, 15. The Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, You may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat of it. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. So notice what we see. The reign and rule of God over mankind leads to perfect life. Rejection of his reign and rule leads to death. So then, no, no, submit to my reign and rule. Submit to my kingliness. Submit to my authority, and you have life. Reject my reign and rule and my authority, and then you have death. So don't eat the forbidden tree. Because the forbidden tree will lead to your death. And I'm good. And my reign and rule is good. But then Satan tempts Adam and Eve. And how does he do it? How does Satan tempt Adam and Eve? He gets them to pit their reign and rule against God's reign and rule. Instead of seeing the very reign and rule that leads to my life in paradise and flourishing, let me think about if I could compete and have my own reign and rule. Genesis 3, verse 4. The serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die, for God knows when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you'll be like God, knowing good and evil. But again, they're already like God, made in his image. And they know good and evil, at least in part. Good, obey the reign and rule of God and live. Evil, disobey the reign and rule of God and die. They at least know in part. So when the woman saw the tree was good for food, it was a delight to the eyes. The tree was desired to make one wise. She took of its fruit and ate. She also gave some to her husband who was with her. He ate. The eyes of both were open and they knew they were naked. They sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and the wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Friends, this is where sin leaves you. Full of shame and guilt and hiding from God. God is the essence of joy. Sin separates you from the source of joy. (laughs) This is why even now when you sin, there's joy there for a minute, but it goes away and it's replaced by shame and guilt. Like it's not a joy that lasts. Because sin separates you from God and means to kill you and end you and destroy you. That's why your sin never ultimately leads to your good, but always to your bad. And so God brings forth his just judgment. He tells the woman, here are your curses. The men, here are your curses. As a result, here's my just judgment on your rebellion. He tells Satan, no, no, there's a, there's a, there's a battle coming. The, so the seed of the serpent, the seed of the woman will collide at some point. And the seed of the woman will crush the serpent's head. This curse that's come into this world will be reversed. It will be crushed. Then God makes a covenant with Abraham, promises to make him a great nation through the continued seed of the woman. The seed is traced through Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Joseph and Moses. It's taught through the prophets. It's governed and overseen by the kings. Israel wanders around in the desert, groaning underneath this curse, longing for the promised land. God continues speaking through the prophets. He continues reigning through the kings. He makes sacrifices of atonement through the priests. Then through Isaiah, God promises, For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and of peace, there'll be no end on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish and uphold it with justice and righteousness from this time forth forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. And then 700 plus years later, Matthew chapter 1, verse 17. So all generations from Abraham to David and from David to Babylon and from uh, Babylon to Christ, 14 generations. And have we not watched Matthew over and over again say Christ fulfilled scripture, Christ fulfilled scripture, Christ fulfilled scripture. Has Jesus not stepped on the scene and said, I'm greater than the temple. I'm greater than the prophet Jonah. I'm greater than King Solomon. Do you see why earlier in this chapter, Jesus told the disciples, blessed are your eyes for they see and your ears for they hear. For truly I say to you, many prophets and righteous people long to see what you see, did not see it, hear what you hear and did not hear it. Jesus reverses the curse. In creation, man was in perfect relationship with the essence of joy, God. In fall, man was separated from God in the fullness of his joy. In redemption, Jesus is restoring the reign and rule of God over his people, reconciling them to God himself, meaning reconciling you to joy. So for those searching for the great treasure, like John the Baptist, you want to sell out once you see that kingdom. 
For those like these disciples who stumble over this great treasure, you see it, you're willing to sell out to follow King Jesus. Why? Because there's no greater treasure than right relationship with the king. He's the essence of joy. This is why the Apostle Paul lets you know, I count it gain. Whatever gain I had, I count it as loss for the sake of Christ. Why? Because he's a greater treasure. <laughs> he's a greater joy. He's what the Old Testament New Testament is showing you. Christ Jesus, he's the treasure, he's the joy, he's who you long for. So as we wrap up, do you realize that your greatest joy is in submitting to the reign and rule of Christ? That's where your greatest joy is found. The happiest you that will ever exist is the you submitting to the reign and rule of Christ. And your unhappiness is due to your rejection of the reign and rule of God. Now this does not mean that after conversion everything is easy. Christ promises us that we will suffer for his name's sake. But again, as we started, there'll be a joy that transcends the high highs and the low lows. A joy that leads to a, pass, a peace that passes all understanding. And we have this treasure. So brothers and sisters, we can't keep it in the storehouse of our hearts. We must give it away. We must go into these treasures and we must show and share these treasures. To be a Christian is to delight in God. That's not just something we say. It's not something I invented. It's just Bible. <laughs> Christians love God. We delight in him. He's our chief treasure and joy. So then to be in a Christian church is to say, I'm going to disciple you. I'm going to encourage you. You disciple encourage me to find more delight in God. Let's go investigate the treasure. Let's go turn around every diamond and look at it from every angle and every passage of Scripture, old and new. Let's encourage one another to find our joy in Christ and flee from sin and flee to joy and flee from sin and flee to joy again and again and again in Christ. And then we got to declare this. Your evangelism ought to be motivated because you found a treasure, a treasure chest of holy joy that you can now take to suffering sinners who once like you had no joy that would satisfy. And you can introduce this, them to this great God. A few applications, preachers and teachers of God's word. Dig, search, find, and show Jesus. Every page of scripture, back out far enough, see the story, point to Christ. But all of you, if you're in the kingdom of Christ, you are rich with joy. And you can say that even in your worst moment when you're lamenting and weeping with grief. I'm rich in joy because I know my joy is forever. So go make the world a better place by sharing the riches of the king and his kingdom. Go give greater joy and as you do that, experience greater joy. King's Cross, know that we'll be doing this a few ways practically. Rachel and I got to go down to Puerto Rico and see a lot of, uh, we got to tour the island and see a bunch of church planting work going on in Puerto Rico. I'm excited about some partnerships we're going to be building there and Lord willing, getting on planes and taking you to, to join in some of that work. There's multiple conversations I'm having about some of the first kind of King's Cross church plants. So we're praying and begging and pleading, and there's some serious conversations beginning to happen. Why? Because we want this joy to go out. We, we've got this treasure chest of holy joy. We want to share it with the world. We want to do that through adoption and foster care. So at the end of the service, we'll have a few announcements to hear. How can we share this treasure chest of holy joy with uh, the, the least of these, with those, the most vulnerable? We're going to hear tonight, I would invite all of you to come back for our Sunday evening prayer service. We're going to hear about some church revitalization work in Portugal and hear from our brother Tiago uh, about the work he's doing there. But in conclusion, notice there's three types of people. Those who stumble upon this treasure, those who search for this treasure and find it, and then those who will suffer eternally for rejecting it. The glorious news is there's greater joy for all who will look to Christ. That this life is the worst it will ever be for the believer. That there's greater joy to come. The terrifying news is you can reject that, be unsatisfied by lesser joys, and then suffer forever. So we would just plead with you. Turn to Christ. Turn to him as your chief treasure. If you've got any questions about how to do that, we want to help you. But for all sufferers and sinners who come to Christ, there's greater joy. No matter your current circumstances or current feelings, there's going to be glory. There's going to be glory. There'll be glory after this. No need to worry in this present suffering. There'll be glory after this. Let's close in prayer.